Yes, thank you. Very interesting uh, panel discussion. Um, before we move on to the next uh, panel, uh, I'd like to uh, point your attention uh, towards the workshops that will be organized uh, tomorrow afternoon. So if you have not yet registered, please feel free to register for one of the two workshops tomorrow afternoon. Um, then now I'd like to continue with the next uh, panel discussion and invite Katherine Jose to the stage to discuss the role of SMEs as engines for innovation and uh, change related to the circular economy. The floor is yours. Enjoy. Well, we'll make a start and Enrique can join us in a minute. He was here a second ago, so uh, not sure what we've done with him. But good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. And today, this session is going to be about emerging innovation in SMEs. So SMEs and startups can work as a powerful engine for change. They're unencumbered by culture and hierarchy and legacy infrastructure that may be found in large organizations. They can be reactive. They can identify market opportunities and can develop solutions relatively quickly. They're fertile spaces for innovation and embrace divergent thinking and multidisciplinary approaches to address the most challenging problems. And we know the circular economy and getting there quickly is a challenging problem. So we'll be talking about the roles that SMEs will play in the emerging circular economy um, and looking at it at, in some respects through city scale. We're going to try and answer questions like, what could cities and regions do to support SMEs on their circular journey? How can cities differentiate their offer? And how can cities procure from innovative SMEs? We've got an incomplete but excellent panel of speakers who are going to look at these questions through a range of lenses, looking at regional development support, national innovation programs, and also a real live SME. So that's great. How we're going to run this panel is actually each of our speakers has a very brief five minute presentation to introduce themselves and give their thoughts on, on the answers to some of these questions. We're then going to have a bit of discussion before, of course, giving time for you as the audience to ask your burning questions. So let's go to the first presentation. I don't know how that gets advanced. Let's, do we have a clicker? Ah, it's me. <laughs> Okay, so that was my introduction to the panel, but I also have an introduction to myself and my organization. Um, so I work for an organization called the Knowledge Transfer Network. We're a slightly unique organization. Uh, we're funded by the UK government to essentially act as a networking service for businesses. So our role is to bring together businesses, entrepreneurs, academics, and funders to help develop new products and services. So essentially, we find people who have great ideas and try and give them all the help they need to get that idea to market faster. The idea is to create jobs in the UK and to support innovative ideas happening in the UK. So we are a, mainly a sector-focused organization. So our experts get to know a whole sector in depth. Who are the innovative SMEs? Who are the most interesting universities? Who are the large corporates? What are their directional strategies? Um, but of course, we recognize that innovation really happens at the interface. So although we get to know a sector in depth, we then really are trying to take people outside their sector. So we've run events, for example, looking at how satellite data can support the waste industry or how design can help solve challenges for Alzheimer's. And of course, circular economy is a great cross-sectoral challenge. And that's where I focus my efforts in helping UK companies. So our circular economy program was founded a couple of years ago to try and drive circular economy innovation with, within companies in the UK. We've built a uh, network of over 500 innovators. We've supported over 70 companies develop circular economy projects. Um, and one of those I've got an example of on the next slide. We run a lot of events like this. So bringing people together, trying to kind of create those collaborations and networking experiences and we've helped a lot of companies access grant funding to do circular economy projects. So just one little case study, since we're talking about SMEs. 
uh, you probably, you definitely can't read that, um, but if you want these slides afterwards, I'll be happy to give them to you. But Ripe Office is a, is a company that was actually founded with a £5,000 grant from the UK government. And they really recognised the opportunity of um, remanufactured office furniture, but coming at it very much from a design perspective. So they work with kind of big corporate clients who, who might have a sustainability agenda, might in theory like to procure remanufactured furniture, but really quality and design and fitting in with their corporate image sort of trounce all those things. So what Ripe do is they come along and say, we can design you an office however you like. It can be in your corporate pink if that's what, what you want. But we will go away and using our network of remanufacturing suppliers, we will supply exactly what you need. So they, they come in at it from a very interesting angle of, we'll give you what you want and don't really worry about how we make it happen. But actually, we're going to make it happen through remanufacturing and we're going to bring all those benefits like um, massively reduced carbon footprint. So that's, uh, they're, they're doing great. They've recently um, gone through a big investment round. They're growing rapidly and have got a really impressive book of clients now. Um, and I'm sure we'll be expanding outside of the UK before long. So in answer to the questions or some of the questions to start, what could cities and regional authorities do to support SMEs on their circular economy journey? Well, here, here's my two pence. So first of all, ensure the general innovation system is functioning well. SMEs, whatever they're trying to do, face obvious challenges. They're time poor, they're cash poor. They're just constantly running to survive and only thinking sometimes the next few months ahead. This is no different if you're a circular economy SME to if you're um, any other SME. So make sure that general ecosystem is right to support entrepreneurship, to support innovation. SMEs need to understand the wider global context with which they operate. Sometimes these big trends and market drivers can be hard for a small SME to understand. And that's where a role of organizations like myself can play a role. And identify specific regional capabilities and opportunities. So we're a big fan of kind of place-based innovation. So actually understanding what is unique about my area, what, wh where have I got some, something, whatever that is, that's different to everywhere else and support growing through, through that. And we heard a lot of that yesterday in the idea of cities being villages and having their own culture and growing, growing businesses based on the culture of a city. Um, and also cities need to act as test beds. Again, yesterday we heard a lot about how they're aggregators of resources. Um, so they're the perfect place sometimes where you've got a high concentration of people, of, of logistics, and also materials and products to act as a test bed for circular economy ideas. Um, if you're wondering what that cross on the right is, that's our view of where all the innovation opportunities for circular economy exist. Um, and again, you can't read it probably, but happy to share it with anyone who wants to give me their business card afterwards. So I'll stop there and let's see who we've got coming up next. Oh, no one. <laughs> Ah, uh, Kate. Thank you, Catherine. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very happy to be here to talk about New York City's efforts to integrate the circular economy um, into some of the thinking of, of emerging innovation and how we can impact SMEs to ensure that they benefit from some policy uh, incentives and interventions that we can bring to the table. And so you can see on the first slide some of the advantages and challenges all in one that, that we have in New York City. And so we have uh, tremendous challenges. For example, we create 24,000 tons of waste every day. We have a $1.5 billion sanitation budget annually to address this waste. But clearly what we're all seeing and attempting to do is not simply have 
the end of the pipe solutions that are a little bit after the fact, but really seeing how can we catalyze SMEs in emerging technology to address some of the design challenges and other challenges that, that are part of the circular economy. So what we're doing in New York is we're very focused on fostering a both resilient and diverse economic growth strategy. And coming out of the economic crisis of 2008, it was very clear that we did not want to only be focusing on a small number of anchor industries, but we really want to make sure that we capitalize on the talent that exists in New York City. We have the largest student population of any city in the United States. We have over 100 universities and colleges, and that's a very robust talent pipeline. We want to make sure that that talent stays in New York City and helps grow our economy. And so the work that we do cuts across multiple sectors, whether financial services, life sciences, healthcare, manufacturing, and, and fashion. And we try to link the anchor, econ anchor industries within those sectors with the emerging entrepreneurs and innovators who are bringing new ideas to that area. And so we use a few tools to do that, and, and some of them are creating hubs for cross-pollination of emerging technologies within diverse sectors. So we have launched just this year a hub for smart cities software, in addition to a separate hub for smart cities hardware, and next year we're launching a hub for advanced manufacturing that will have shared equipment, shared co-working space with access to equipment like 3D printers, robotics, and CNC routers. And in many ways, we, we are the global hub for certain legacy industries. For example, with fashion, not only do we have the headquarters of many multinational companies, we have a very robust retail base, we have a very strong designer economy, both emerging and established designers, and we still have local manufacturing hubs within Manhattan and Brooklyn and other parts of the city. That complete ecosystem for fashion is, is a very important part of New York City's economy. And I think that we will talk a little bit more later today about the ways that the circular economy can impact fashion, which is a, a critical international industry in terms of being the second biggest polluter on the planet and also a real strong economic driver. So how can we take the challenge and the opportunity and merge them together in support for SMEs within New York City? Critical to our efforts are the policy drivers within New York. We have stated goals of an 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050 and a stated goal of zero waste to landfills by 2030. Those are very ambitious and aggressive goals and serve as the sort of incentive that we need for emerging SMEs and established SMEs to start becoming part of the solution and solving the problem along with the city. And of course, government cannot do this alone. And so we're looking at public-private partnerships and also adding philanthropy to that. And our collaboration with the Alan MacArthur Foundation has been, has been critical in terms of catalyzing our efforts across both the corporations that the foundation works with closely and the startups that, that we catalyze the growth for locally. Um, and also want to sort of bring in the local universities as well as partners. So starting from the, the basis of these thought partners and convening to then move ahead to very specific programmatic interventions. And I think the, the last point that I would like to make is that although addressing the consumer issue is a challenging one and as a government entity we are not consumer facing in our efforts, what we have done is had efforts to catalyze the local SMEs in their motivations that are more consumer facing. Um, and so we really want to promote new business models that are of course in many ways very disruptive but that take advantage of the emerging consumer trends which always go in the direction of greater convenience, more collaborative consumption, and the impact that the internet of things and the sort of shared media that are more prevalent among consumption trends now. How do we make sure that the SMEs are taking advantage of those consumer trends and that we're supportive of those efforts from a policy perspective? Um, as the, the SMEs that are disrupting these traditional commerce tools are the ones that I think we're going to see the most growth in. And so we want to make sure that we're clearing the way and assessing the market gaps and the market opportunities and creating initiatives that can clear those obstacles. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kate. Um, next, I'd like to invite Eric Lockton, who's the CEO of Ecor, and he's going to be uh, a bit interactive with his presentation, I understand. I'll do that.
There we are. I think I'll uh, take this one. Um, in uh, preparation uh, of this uh, uh, event, I uh, immediately decided to directly answer the questions Catherine has been asking us in before. So her question was, uh, what could and should cities and regional authorities do to support small medium enterprises on the circular economy jo uh, journey? I think it boils down to once they know and once they want and have established clear values on the road they want to take, then they should initiate, facilitate and catalyze. At the end, it will boil down to that. And to explain this, I'll uh, have to tell you a little bit about the company I'm representing here. And um, but that's the product Eco. So about a decade of uh, uh, R&D, de uh, developed in technology where we can use with only water, pressure, and heat. We can make a panel out of any kind of, almost any kind of cellulose, fiber, waste streams. And f cellular fiber waste streams are everywhere. And I just want to let you feel also and see a couple of these products. So basically, this is made out of um, beverage cartons. Yeah. I have to tell what you're handing out. Uh, this is old office paper. Um, there is coffee panels. There is a veneer. Um, we've, we can print on it. It's uh, from Span Brewers Grain. You can laminate, there is a weed straw going in there, and all these different kind of applications and opportunities are there. So what do we do with this, and how do we work with, as, uh, with governments and cities? So basically, what we, uh, I'm going to uh, use a, an example of a province in the Netherlands, where we've got uh, uh, the province represented, three uh, of the cities in the province, they get to the table, um, a multinational out of that region who's, got, who's getting waste streams of cellulose, and they've got a social housing corporation who wants to build more uh, sustainable, healthier housing with no VUC use materials. We get all these stakeholders on the table, and we map out what is the consistent stream of these fibers. What is the offtake? How can we guarantee this? What is the viable business model? And once that fi business model is made with government, city, commercial uh, uh, activities and SMEs, then we'll, they can decide if they want a local conversion facility in their region. In that business case, then this elf is going to manufacture the e-car, which could be from uh, wheat straw, which could be from corrugated cardboard, which could be from jeans or coffee grounds or whatever. And then that material will find its uh, offtake in the region and on a place. That's how we like to do this. Um, so basically, what would you need for, an exi for a facility like that? We only need water, heat, energy, renewable energy, and waste. And then we can take urban fibers, farm fibers, or forest fibers, which we can convert into eco, which then finds a way into the building and construction, signing and display, and so on. But the essence of this is that eco is enabling, and we need to be co-creative. And co-creative you can be with designers, like architectural firms, product designers, uh, technical designers. But also you need to have fabricators, like printers, laser cutters, traditional carpenters, and so on. Then you go into a cooperation with each other, and you take the co-responsibility together. This is how we visualize this. So I don't know if there's a laser pointer. So we take a waste stream, which goes into an eco living factory, and then the market comes in and does something with that. They can alter it into a material. This can be business to business or business to consumer. When the acre is at the end of its user cycle, it can go back in the factory again, and by mixing in the existing waste streams, it can have an endless cycle into this, into this market. And into it. So basically, local waste, local production facilities, but regional industrial partners, regional consumer usability, and, when, and a rest stream, when, which is global and scalable, that's what we do, enabling you to achieve your circular economy goals. That's basically what we're out. And this was within the time frame. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And uh, 
I guess if you could pass the uh, samples back to the front, that would be great. <laughs> oh, Maria's taking them at the back. OK, pass them to the back. Um, great. So now I'm going to introduce Mariona Sands, who's Business Innovation Director at Axio from the Government of Catalonia. Do you want this one? Yes, please. I think it will be better with the microphone. No? <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this session. So uh, Axio is the agency for innovation, for competitiveness, for business competitiveness of the Catalan government. And uh, one of the axes of competitiveness is innovation. And we are the agency that is, uh, takes care of the innovation of, uh, of business. And, and Catalonia is a country of, is an SME country. So we take care of SMEs and the innovation of SMEs. So circular economy for us, it's a, it's a source of innovation for, uh, for SMEs. And this is why we are working very much on this, uh, on this issue. We are committed on circular economy. And in fact, as my colleague uh, previous mentioned, uh, circular economy is one of the chapters of the, industri of the national uh, industrial agreement that we are signing down together the government with the social agents in, in Catalonia. So what is the panorama of uh, innovation in Catalonia? You see here some figures of uh, what, is the, what is the average of companies uh, investing in innovation in Catalonia. So the 54% of companies in, in Catalonia invest in innovation. 57.2% uh, of these companies also are international, which means that all companies that are, com are competitive because they invest in innovation and also they are internationalized. And uh, most of the companies, the 85.7 of the companies that invest in innovation, think that the next year will increase their, uh, uh, their, 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 their benefits. No? So this is a, a, a very good uh, exercise that we have uh, already uh, put in place uh, in Catalonia uh, with the Barometer de la Innovació, which is our own statistics on innovation, which uh, has been realized uh, taking into account not only the investments that uh, companies do in traditional innovation in terms of technology or uh, personal dedicated, but also all what is related to intangibles. Mm? So in these terms, uh, circular economy could be one of these intangibles, uh, source of, for, of investment, in terms that when a company uh, is investing in innovation, they are uh, changing organizational procedures, they are investing, of course, in products and services, they are changing management processes and models, they're investing in marketing and communication, in brand value, and also in new business models. We have also analyzed which are the, the companies dedicated in, in Catalonia in, in circular economy. Uh, this is an exercise that we have been doing together with other departments of Generalitat. And, and the total offer, companies offering solutions in terms uh, uh, for circular economy in Catalonia and the, are these 400 companies, are companies coming coming from waste, uh, resource, water, energy, etc., which are offering solutions to, 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 the, to the global uh, industrial sector. And, and, and the total turnover of, this, of these companies are around 4,000 million euros. This, is, this represents 30% of the total turnover of these companies in Catalonia. We have also been... Uh, uh, Fine. We have also found that there is an increasing demand of companies from, no, from other sectors, such as, for example, food, textile, fashion, households, packaging, urban equipment, mobility sectors, which are acquiring these kind of solutions offered by the traditional companies dedicated to, uh, to, to environment and, and, and energy, water, etc. And what are the main uh, actions that we as a government are putting in place to support companies and to support specifically SMEs, which are, are the main target group of our uh, companies in Catalonia? First of all, we are creating uh, awareness of, uh, about circular economy. And this is why we are working very much in co close cooperation with uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, with the tools that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is uh, it's, uh, a, a, um, offering us, we are using them to spread uh, uh, this knowledge on, on circular economy. 
uh, we are mapping the economy of circular economy, of circul as you may, as you have said. Uh, we we have now the panorama of which is the the main uh, the main offer, and also which are the sectors that could be interested in in uh, in circular economy, and we have uh, specific tools to support companies. Mm? We are now working in different pilots in, in the sector of, for example, mobility or, or fashion or food. And we are putting in place uh, or we are offering uh, what, uh, all the innovation tools that uh, to support uh, all what is related to R&D and innovation. And uh, we have for this, these uh, specific tools, for example, eco vouchers, which are uh, services the vouchers that we uh, distribute uh, among companies in order to access to uh, technology services uh, that uh, at the end uh, give solutions for a circular economy to SMEs. Uh, all these tools are uh, specifically designed uh, to support companies, to support SMEs in the process of investment in circular economy. And uh, at the end of, or uh, in, in tw uh, of, tw uh, of 2020, we'll have the results and the impact of these tools, and we'll have the chance to analyze what will be the final result. Uh, I have been very, very brief, because I have prepared also a video that will show you uh, what are all these tools that we put in place. And also, we have uh, you, you will see some testimonials, some companies that already have solutions in Catalonia, uh, coming from the sectors of urban equipment, uh, management, industrial wastes, also retail and electrical mobility. I, I hope you enjoy the video now. The circular economy is based on maximum leverage of resources and the reduction of waste generation to a minimum. The idea is to go beyond the extraction economic model based on production, consumption and disposal and to gradually move towards a more sustainable economy. A person consumes on average 16 tonnes of materials every year. Of these, six tonnes become waste, and almost half of the waste ends up in landfills. This new model understands that natural resources are finite. Therefore, materials and resources need to be reused as often as possible. The circular economy can double the profits created by the current model. Furthermore, it would reduce raw material consumption by 32% and cut emissions by half. This new model is not only environmentally friendly, but also represents a significant financial opportunity for companies and is a driver for innovation. Nosaltres hem, hem contribuït a demostrar durant aquests anys que treballar amb residus pot ser una aventura fantàstica, pot ser una font de negoci i pot ser una manera de que altres empreses també s'animin i, i vegin en els residus una gran oportunitat com vam fer nosaltres 10 anys enrere. For businesses, eliminating waste through the reuse of materials has numerous benefits, including increasing resource productivity, cost savings, differentiation from competition, access to new markets, incorporating innovation. This is why more and more companies opt for this model. Hi ha molt d'interès darrere de, dels nostres productes i que al contrari de la creença estesa que hi ha de que el medi ambient doncs, no, és, no és rentable, hi ha, hi ha negoci darrere de l'economia circular i és, és important per la societat i, i pel teixit empresarial. Implementing the circular economy means contributing to create a more sustainable society and future. Some of the short-term advantages are Reduction of energy consumption per person Improving people's health Lesser impact on the environment And creating new jobs related to repairing, remanufacturing, energy and resources, recycling and mobility. És una necessitat aplicar l'economia circular per a la societat. Fa compatible les necessitats del nostre planeta, de la natura i dels recursos naturals amb les necessitats dels éssers humans. There are 400 companies in Catalonia implementing the circular economy in the areas of waste materials, water and renewable energy. 
Catalonia works to promote environmental, economic and social sustainability. And it now has 217 research groups and technology centres that are innovating and performing environmental research to provide different solutions to companies. Jo crec que Catalunya és una terra amb un perfil emprenedor en termes generals i a més a més que està molt preocupada i vinculada amb coses que passen arreu del món. Una d'elles seria tot el tema de l'economia sostenible i la cura per al medi ambient. En aquest sentit, el fet que haguem llançat un servei on estem promocionant o afavorint l'ús compartit en lloc de la propietat d'un producte de difícil reciclatge, com puguin ser vehicles de dues rodes, i a més a més amb un ús d'una energia sostenible, com és l'elèctrica, doncs crec que tenia molt sentit que ho testegéssim i tingués un origen a la ciutat de Barcelona per després exportar-lo a d'altres ciutats. The trend of recent years suggests that countries with greater well-being and social equality are those committed to more sustainable growth models. Undergoing a transition to the circular economy allows us to take on global challenges such as climate change, making economic development compatible with the efficient use of resources. That's great. I'm off now. How do I turn this back on? Hello. I'm on. Okay, good. Thanks. That was really interesting. I've not seen a region uh, quantify their number of circular economy companies before. So, And I'm delighted to introduce our missing panellist who has joined us, which is great. Enrique Villamore, Director, Regional Activities Centre for Sustainable Consumption and Production. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will use this micro because I think that uh, you can hear me better. So thank you very much for inviting us to, to attend this interesting workshop. Um, I'm coming here to bring you basically good news from the Mediterranean region, which is a region which, unfortunately, uh, when you see the TV news, is not, uh, at least it's not showing that uh, it's really a kind of a uh, region uh, that is um, going through a very, let's say, uh, good times, because unfortunately we're seeing a lot of uh, problems going on in our region. However, there are many things which are, which are great, and I'm here to explain you some of them. Uh, first of all, let me briefly uh, tell you what we are. We are SCP RAC. We are based here in Barcelona, in the Art Nouveau um, San Pau, San Pau, uh, San Pau site. And basically, we're an organization working for cooperation for the 21 Medi Mediterranean countries. Uh, those include the ones from North Africa, Middle East, and so, uh, the Southern European Union. And in that sense, uh, our objective is basically the following. That Mediterranean, the Mediterranean region is one of the world's leading regions into the transition to green and circular economy. I know that this kind of sounds kind of strong. So like, wow, what do you mean, guy? I mean, basically, this is something maybe too much because we know that this is, a, this is a kind of region bringing together different countries with different cultures, also with different levels of development, so on and so forth. But as you perfectly know, since ancient times, this region has been, have been bringing together countries that have shared a common culture of innovation based on the care of resources and the care of the environment. And this is continuing being so. Um, so I would like to briefly explain you what, what we do in order to make this uh, contribution to this vision that uh, our center has. I, as you have, have you seen, I have tried to, let's say, to, to put in different colors the type of actions we're developing in order for me to explain you in which areas we are kind of stronger and which are the areas which are, which, in which, uh, on which we are still, uh, let's say, on the process of becoming strong and be useful for the region. Uh, first of all, one of, let's say, our, our uh, core business areas in the center is uh, the work on supporting, training and supporting entrepreneurs, providing solutions and services based on a circular economy and green approach. We can say that we are strong in this uh, kind of uh, action. We have developed specific training materials for this type of entrepreneurs, green entrepreneurs, 
And so far, we have trained about 2,000 entrepreneurs. And in the, last, in the next two years, we'll be able to train up to 3,000 entrepreneurs, not only from North Africa and Middle East, OK? Out of which you are going to provide a kind of, a, let's call it a um, coaching series during eight months to the best 50 uh, cases out of all the 3,000 will be training. We are also good on, uh, let's say, showcasing case, successful case studies of green entrepreneurs and, and green startups. And we do so through this platform, Switchers. The Switchers is a platform in which you can find case studies, stories from entrepreneurs from different sectors, renewable energy, organic food, sustainable textiles, clothing, waste prevention, eco-design, and so on, from different countries of the region. So far, we have been able to collect uh, case studies from the countries you have seen there. Oops, sorry. But this is a platform which is uh, growing, and we expect that the next two years we'll be able to collect over 400 cases of green entrepreneurs. So what uh, we are aiming at achieving through this platform, basically, is to establish a plan through which entrepreneurs and startups from all Mediterranean countries can connect between each other in order to create a market, which is something that is not uh, well considered. We know that there is a demand, of course, as you perfectly know as well at the, at the global level. There is, of course, an, an offer, but this uh, demand and offer is not well connected. So we are trying to work on achieving that uh, this becomes a reality. Um, other kind of actions that we develop as I was referring to, connecting entrepreneurs, businesses, and investors. This is something that we're starting to do since the last two years. And in that sense, we have currently, for example, developing what we call the Green Impact Investment Network, which is an initiative with, through which we try to basically um, talk with, uh, with financiers, with financial uh, agents, with investors, to explain them that it is worth to invest on circular economy, to explain them that it is worth, it is worth to, explain, uh, to invest in innovation. And uh, even we are starting, we are kind of, let's say, starting to be also successful because, for example, we are working now with the main local uh, bank on of Turkey in training uh, their technical advisors on eco-design and innovation so that they can pass the message to their customers, to the SMEs, so that they can tell their SMEs that they need to invest on eco-innovation companies or uh, circular economy companies. Um, in relation to this, um, and uh, in relation to this uh, network we are, uh, we are trying to, to, to create with uh, investors and financial institutions, we are trying in that sense to, to see if we can create a, a network of these kind of agents together with entrepreneurs so that we, they can agree on establishing certain types of specific mechanisms through which both SMEs and entrepreneurs can easily have access to, to funding, which is, which as you know, is one of the main, uh, let's say, challenges that both an entrepreneur or uh, an SME faces in order to invest in these kind of solutions. Also, we are looking at other, uh, let's say, funding alternatives, as for example, the crowdfunding. We just recently developed uh, a study on uh, the status of the art of crowdfunding platforms in the North African countries and Middle East with certain kind of, uh, well, interesting findings. Um, on the other hand, in another action in which we are, let's say, strong, we are pretty strong in lobbying, let's say, lobby policy makers to consolidate the support to entrepreneurship as key pillar in the international environmental uh, policy agenda, especially for the Mediterranean and also at the international level. I will put you an example. Um, as an organization, we work within the framework of an international treaty, which is called the Barcelona Convention. This is an international treaty bringing together the 21 Mediterranean countries, and it's a legally binding treaty in principle. And uh, currently, circular economy has been introduced as one of the key pillars for the, let's say, the, the program of work of this convention for the next year. And accordingly, there is, there are, there is let's say, funding and activities in support to the countries under this convention. As I, mean, I must to mention developing countries because we're talking about cooperation, let's say, the cooperation field. So unfortunately, the developed ones are not, uh, let's say, receiving funding. But there is, uh, thanks to this, uh, to this fact, there is uh, money, basically, uh, provided to support developing countries on investing in circular economy projects. 
Also, we work under another convention, the Stockholm Convention for Persistent Organic Pollutants. This is a convention which is bringing together about 150 countries fighting against this type of uh, toxic uh, chemicals. Uh, that as one of most, many of you know, are chemicals as, for example, uh, dioxins, furans, uh, endosulfan, which are kind of uh, toxins which we can find or in our agriculture or even in our products, the products that we consume. So now we are currently, just to refer to this uh, issue about the lobbying, we are currently trying to introduce in the policy agenda of this convention the issue on toxic chemicals in plastics so that these 150 countries start to establish hard measures in order to find for alternatives to these toxics in plastics and also in the products containing plastic so that we can get rid of this uh, problem and in that sense promote the market of alternatives. Um, another issue that we're starting to explore but in which we are not still, let's say, experts, but we think it's ver it will be very important for the few, basically for the next few years, few years about integrating innovation and entrepreneurship in the curricula of both universities and, and um, schools. What we have seen is that so far, most of these kind of, let's say, uh, subjects are kind of deal with by some universities, universities, but not in an integrated manner, but a kind of isolated manner or a kind of sec sec sectoralized manner when we consider it should be integrated fully in the conventional careers or degrees like economy, law, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> we have a strong network in all these 21 uh, Mediterranean countries. We, you, can, uh, you can find them, uh, ay, 44 minutes. You can find them in the platform I was mentioning. And basically, another of the last uh, issues we want also to tackle in the next uh, years will be about really contributing to match the offer and demand I was referring to before. So that's it. Thank you very much. These are our partners and funders. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Enrique. And uh, it's good that we've got so much enthusiasm that we can't contain ourselves to the stage today. So I enjoy those presentations. They've certainly triggered some questions in my mind. We're going to have a bit of a chat. Um, probably for around 10 minutes, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, and then open it up to questions from the floor. So use the app if you like, but we will also uh, take questions from the microphone there. So if you want to stand up and ask your question, that's great too. So I'm going to start with Kate, since you're next to me. Um, how important in this acceleration of circular economy with SMEs do you think the the sort of pure play companies are. So by that I mean SMEs who are really mission focused and have circular economy kind of driven through their whole core. Or do you think it's more important to mainstream this thinking in larger corporates? Um, that, that's a great question. And I think that the, the mission driven SMEs are absolutely critical, but there are simply not enough of them to create a, enough of a core for the movement, at least in New York City, I find that to be the case. So we absolutely want us to support those mission-driven organizations. Um, I think that there's something in between those mission-driven organizations and mainstreaming the notions to corporations. And I think in between those two spaces are new business models. And so what we're seeing in New York City is that there are SMEs who are seeing a market demand for new and innovative business models, they're not necessarily driven by circular economy principles, but the result is that the work that they're doing does conform to circular economy principles. So some examples within the fashion industry would be, I think an example of a, of a corporation would be H&M, and they're incorporating, incorporating circular economy principles into the work that they're doing. They, they have the bins, you can return the clothes, get a voucher to incentivize you to buy even more clothes. And they're also incentivizing some, some R&D to see how can they break down the cotton and polyester that they use in their fabrics. And so that's, it's great that they're doing one effort in that area, but I think what's more interesting for us in New York is looking at emerging business models like New York-based companies like Rent the Runway, where they're looking at a collaborative consumption model where you share the clothing. There's also an, um, an emerging startup in New York called Closet Collective that's a peer-to-peer -peer based clothing sharing application. So you have a technology platform and you go online and you borrow from someone else's closet, not from a company, but from a peer. And so I think that those 
those new business models that are really reactive to the sort of connectivity along social platforms and collaborative consumption and the sharing economy. That's where I think that we're seeing SMEs that are conforming to CE goals without having that be a part of their mission explicitly. Great, thanks. Anyone want to add anything to Kate's nice answer? Thank you. I would maybe to briefly uh, mention something recently, let's say, to the experience from a, an organization work, working in the field of cooperation. Um, during many years, we have been working um, and trying, let's say, to let's say to train um, SMEs and, and industries on, on basically implementing clean production eco-efficiency tools, so, you know, solutions, so on and so forth, or circular economy, etc. Um, but maybe because, let's say, the lack of resources of these. Uh, of normally these kind of uh, companies, uh, once you provide the training, the knowledge, I mean, there is a huge, let's say, problem, which is basically that they have to continue working and uh, adding, let's say, uh, uh, issues related to new kind of technologies um, involves a kind of new challenge or problem for which normally there are no maybe investment in terms of money or in terms of time um, or in innovation, uh, research, etc. So we have, we, uh, what we are seeing in the last, uh, in the last, years is that what about trying to um, basically to bring on board the, as I would mention, the financial institutions? Because, I mean, traditionally, the financial institutions, of course, hate risk investments. However, if you, if you manage to communicate them, to them that uh, basically investing in these kind of solutions, of course, implies some risk, but the benefits can be absolutely great. And uh, you manage to uh, just maybe to, to just involve some of them, and you succeed, uh, you are successful in maybe showing one case of a bank investing on a small uh, company, and this small company bring a lot of benefits, then let's say that the, the idea, let's say the, the probability of upscaling, I think it's, uh, it's uh, very big. And we are trying now to address uh, uh, financial, the, financial the financial sector, specifically, for example, the, uh, the European uh, Bank for Reconstruction and, and Development. And uh, let's say we have been, we have managed to to, to speak their language, and now, basically, they are thinking on the possibility of um, replicating a project we are now developing with them in Turkey. So, just wanted to add this, uh, this point. Thank you. Great, thanks. So, I'm gonna turn to Eric now. Um, question for you. How much do you think cities and regional bodies should direct SMEs in their innovation direction? Or should it really be just a purely market-led? decision um, I think at the end of the day it will be market-led uh, on the innovation but also what I try to address is that um, the cities and the regional bodies should f try and facilitate and initiate so um, to give you an example on what we've been doing in the Netherlands we tend to live on the least sea level which is quite an uh, risky activity when the water uh, reservancies don't, uh, don't work. So basically there was a new technology developed to get the cellulose fibers out of the sewage water before it enters the water purification system. Yeah? Um, we could take these uh, cellulose fibers and we made panels out of that, which then these water reservancies can use within the buildings of the dikes within when they're pouring concrete at the forming box because the cellulose will solve in the water. So, at the one hand, you've got an innovator, an SME, who can provide the technology. You will have uh, the water reservoirs working for us. The business model was already made because with 25, uh, with getting the cellulose fibers out of the water purification, 25% uh, of the cap capacity increase was already reached, so that's billions. Um, and that collaboration will always be there. So they should initiate and catalyze. That's what's help. Yes. Um, so we, we are a regional body providing funding to companies. So, and we are providing this funding in terms when always uh, invest in a very pre-competitive uh, uh, activity. So once the company uh, find their own way to be to transform their their investment in in market activities. The the public funding is not there anymore. 
So once the circular econo economy will be uh, an activity that, that is seen for a company as a profitable activity, I think that sh uh, public body should not be there. But uh, still, I think that there is some, some, some space for uh, public uh, support. Mm? Okay, great. Um, that actually, Eric's answer kind of leads me to another question where obviously there's quite a specific opportunity identified uh, due, to the, due to the sea level. So, Mariana, to you again, how do cities and regions identify their USPs? So how do they know what's special about themselves? How do they differentiate themselves in a, in a globalized market? Um, and is this even more tricky when we're talking about a subject which is so broad and intangible as the circular economy? Yeah. <laughs> so we have made an exercise of trying to um, identify which are the main sectors in Catalonia which are more competitive and have most chances to be competitive uh, internationally. So we are a very white country and, and there is, uh, there are, we have any sector that is more than the 20% of the GDP. And this is... Uh, this is complex because uh, we cannot focus in one specific sector. So we have very different sectors, but even though we have identified seven big uh, areas that we consider the most competitive, these areas are the ones that are investing more in terms of research, innovation, and has more um, are more internationalized in, and, and they have powerful companies and also a lot of cooperation with research and innovation within these sectors. So this is why we, we are trying to, to, be, to differentiate our economy and how we are uh, gaining a, a competitive uh, position in, in the world. So in terms of uh, circular economy, all our instruments that we are putting in place to foster uh, research and innovation has, uh, has introduced a criteria, an evaluation criteria, taking into account that companies invest in circular economy. So all, this compa all the companies that invest in circular economy, has, when they, we evaluate their projects, have more uh, chances to get funded because they, they already have put in place some, some activity related to circular economy. Great. Do you want to add anything from New York perspective on that one? No, on that one. Fair enough. OK. So um, Eric again. There's often many different ways to tackle a given problem. So there's many different solutions. But sometimes economies of scale are required to really make it work. So how do we balance the challenge between technology lock-in potentially hampering future innovation? So how do we balance the conflict between innovation and standardization? And you know, if you're an SME, you might be the winner. You might get there first. You might scale. Or you might be the loser. OK, thank you for the question. Um, yeah. I, I, I think in essence, and when I'm trying to recapture and, un and understand what you're actually asking is how as an innovation can, you can go through and, and through, um, grow bigger. Um, in essence, a lot of the innovations will not come out of the industry which they apply to. Um, and um, we will, you will see that in these stories, it is always about being quicker and faster instead of the large ones. Um, but I'll give you again a, an example of what we experienced on that perspective. Because um, so there is a lot of signage and display. Signage and display is taking in and out 50 uh, times per year, goes in and out. And uh, us not being from that industry, we could find out that um, they always print it on one side. So every week someone comes in takes 50,000 times something out. And the only question we ask is, why don't you print it on the other side? The existing industry is there to make as, not, as much as products as possible, where when you come in as an innovator, you think of the simple thing of flipping a chart. Um, what we've experienced is that uh, at the end of the day, if you want to stop being an, an eternal very promise, you need to, for global upscalability, you need to have a corporation which then takes it in and, and puts it into their operations. Um, 
So, and that's a difficult way to find, but once you've got that w first one, the, the line for being second is very long. Great. Uh, no, no more thoughts no. on that one. I think that st <laughs> standards also, uh, I mean, the basis for standardization is because there has been a previous innovation. Hmm? So standardization also needs uh, innovative solutions that at the end are accepted by the market. No? At, and standards are not forever. Mm. Standards Im, uh, improve, uh, has to be improved, and innovation is crucial to improve the standards. Mm. So Kate earlier brought up business models as maybe a sort of in-between between SMEs and, and, uh, and the large corporates, but a question to anyone on the panel really, are SMEs giving enough focus to business model innovation, or is technology innovation still the main driver? Technology without a business model is no sense. I, I think we, it's universal that, okay. that we agree that they have to go hand in hand. I think, you know, the, the case studies that I mentioned are business model innovations that wouldn't yeah. exist if they didn't have the technology platforms that are that are utilizing very current and new approaches to communication. Um, so I think they're intrinsically connected. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that really chimes with what we found with um, through programs that run in the UK. So uh, We've, we've run a number of funding programs to support high-risk innovation, business-led innovation. And what we've found is where they're trying to do technical and product-led innovation, they end up needing to do business model innovation. And when they start off trying to do business model innovation, they end up needing to do technical innovation. And, and, and these things are very separate often in the minds of the people trying to do them and compartmentalize. Uh, as they go through the projects and they kind of go on the journey, they realize that they can't do one without the other. So. Uh, absolutely, I, I agree with, with all of you on that one. So we've got about 50, oh, sorry. I don't want to uh, cut you off. <laughs> very, very brief. Um, just on this, um, again, from a cooperation perspective, um, um, uh, the United Nations uh, is it's, it's currently developing a, a so-called innovation project, which, we, which is currently addressing to different countries from Asia and also, I think, Africa and, and uh, the Middle East. And uh, the, what, they, uh, what I, the news I've received from them, the message I've received from them is that it's very difficult to really be successful in integrating um, eco-innovation in uh, small and medium businesses uh, because, uh, let's say, the normal eco-innovation refers to the idea of basically modifying changes the business model itself. And uh, this is a kind of approach which is maybe more uh, feasible for in order to implement it in big businesses. While there are other, let's say, more uh, easy kind of call approaches that are more, let's say, uh, feasible for uh, small businesses, as for example, eco-design, basically in order to start by eco-designing a, a, a product in that sense. And um, I would maybe also mention very briefly that um, that uh, I think it's important that uh, focus is much more put put on a, on a promoting eco-innovation in entrepreneurs, because basically what we're doing there is helping them to integrate in in their objective in their challenge. Basically, something that is through which they are going to, to, to have more gainings. While it's more difficult to integrate this kind of uh, uh, innovative issues in existing companies because of the, of the reasons that we'll, of, we all already know. So, that's it. Thank you. Great. Well, we've just got about 10 minutes left. And um, so, I'd like to open it up to, to you all to ask your questions to our esteemed panel. Uh, now, there's two microphones over there if you want to stand up and ask a question. And I understand someone is going to give me the questions from the app. Uh, so I'm hoping. Oh, is that on this? How does it work? It's not on. <laughs> Any questions from the floor? You're all looking very shy. I'm, I'm afraid you have to go to the microphone, which is over there, so we can hear you. No, I'm going to use this one. You've got two microphones now. Is that now. overlapping? Is that overlapping? 
we'll definitely be able to hear you. Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm standing already, so. Uh, Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. My name is Ignacio Cunha. I'm co-founder of Ergo Intelligent Growth. I know some of the projects being uh, uh, explained here. Yeah, because it's overlapping with the speaker here. So uh, my question is uh, to both Eric and, uh, and uh, Enrique. Uh, in the case that, uh, uh, you, Eric, you would like to implement or, I mean, open a factory in the region where Eric, uh, Enrique is uh, operational, what should be needed? Because you know that uh, a feedstock traceability is a critical issue for your product. And it's plenty of uh, 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 useful feedstock in that region, but I'm not 100% sure whether this, uh, there are all the elements needed uh, to open up a factory to produce products like uh, the products you can produce through the eco technology. Am I allowed to? Okay, um, I'm going to take, you've got an airport over here in Barcelona. I was there uh, yesterday. And um, I'll tell you about the process and therefore answering your question, Ignazi. So basically the airport has got the ambition, uh, this is Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands. They've got the ambition to become one of the most sustainable airports in the world. We set out on a pilot project with them where we would uh, define the building shots. So like an airport is always um, renovating a lot and that's where you then walk past when you're uh, on this airport. They use toxical MDF and particle board for that which uh, have got VOCs like formaldehyde and phenyl. We set out on the technical demands and specs of this uh, uh, building shot, which is actually very simple. And then we looked at the waste streams of this airport. And we found that the grass is growing next to the landing strip and the beverage cartons the travelers to, uh, throw away in the terminal, that we could make an echo blend out of that, which lived up to the material they normally use as MDF. So now we're taking their waste streams coming out of the airport, using it for the building shots. When these buildings, when the renovation is then finished, then uh, it goes back into our blender, we make new echo out of it, and blend in new waste streams. So now we've got a commercial party, which want to have a takeoff, but that will not have enough offtake of this factory for this whole region, and in order to get a viable business case for that. So now we're out together seeking for other opportunities and other echo blends, which could be in the housing or what's sort of in that area. And then we get these multi-stakeholders onto, the, uh, onto the table. So now we've got uh, the community of Haarlemmermeer, Amsterdam, and other people working together in order to get to a volume which gives a viable business case for everyone. And the only thing what you need is, again, that cooperation, collaboration, and the taking co-responsibility. Um, it needs to be open-minded because it's quite unique to have a, s a representative of the city, a representative of the local state, a representative of commercial organizations, and a technology provider having open discussions on a table. But that's what needs to be thing. You need to get out of these boxes and you, you need to use this license to think and go out of that up box. I hope this answers your question. A little bit. What's the rest of it then? Well, it answers the question to a certain point, but I think a key point is the supply chain thing. And yeah. I think when you end up in, 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 in regions like a Northern uh, uh, African region, I mean, supply chain management is extremely challenging. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I see your point having this in Schiphol and having this in, uh, in New York City, but my question would be, okay, what should be needed uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, well, don't, don't leave uh, the North, uh, I mean, Northern African and European countries behind that. Because my, my, my feeling is that, and we have a good example in the fashion industry where the supply chain is moving from Asia to Turkey and the Middle East in some products, that then the biggest challenge is, I mean, how educated this supply chain is yeah. and how they, uh, I mean, how willingful they are to share information. Yeah. yeah, basically what we try to do is to have the, uh, f uh, the conversion facility um, as regional and local as possible to where these waste streams are. We've seen in our business models that as soon as you overachieve, over, overgrow 300 kilometers of range, 
then it makes no sense anymore to have a price competitive product towards uh, corrugated cardboard or MDF or so. So we always seek where the, uh, where the material is. At the end of the day, once it's up and running, you can have the re reverse logistics at the ELF itself. So it's about not having one mass production facility somewhere in the region. It's about having small local urban manufacturing and urban mining uh, facilities which we uh, can be. So I think the, the adaptivity of the technology is extremely important to overcome the logistical economical bottleneck which otherwise uh, will appear. Yeah. More? Thank you. Okay. Great. I'm, I'm guessing this is a question for you, Mariona. Um, what are the criteria that you can use to say an SME is actually circular? Uh, it's not a criteria of defining what is a circular SME. I think maybe it's uh, trying to put some criteria on the projects that they are investing that conducts the SME to be more circular. Mm? I guess that the, the definition of a circular SME is not yet on the table as a, as a, as a global, mm? but uh, we are we are uh, trying to put on the table a criteria on on all the projects that we are funding uh, that includes uh, specific actions on circular economy when they develop uh, the, the, the 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 innovation project. Mm? Yeah, I think it's a pretty pretty difficult thing to actually define. Um, I sit on uh, the British Standards Institution Committee, which is developing a framework standard for organizations in the circular economy. And that really sets out um, a framework of principles for an organization to define themselves what they see as their circular business. So rather than probably imposing a definition on companies of what circular is or should be, I think probably at this stage in the game we're at, it's better to let companies fit it within a set of principles or frameworks that allow them to say, well, what, what we can achieve and helps them move in the right direction because um, it, it, we're, we're so far from circular perfection. I think it's more about how we get there at the moment. Did you, did you want to add something, Eric? You look like you were grabbing for the mic there. I guess that now is an, is, is an innovation and in the, in the next years it will be in a standard. Hmm? <laughs> You have to keep talking because I am really struggling with this technology. I just it, no, turns, it turns off every two seconds. <laughs> I can't turn it on again. <laughs> I'll keep talking. So the only thing why I raise my eyebrows is that uh, I think we should stop talking about projects in this sense, because in essence, when it, when it is a disruptive innovation, when it is truly circular, it is not something which has got an A to and Z. It's an endless stream and flows of activities, services, and materials. That's the only thing I why I raised on the topic project. Okay, now I can see the screen again. Um, so to, to anyone on the panel really, w what are some of the most impactful tools that municipalities can use to implement support? Sorry, I'm reading very badly here. What, what are some of the most impactful tools that can be used by municipalities to support existing SMEs in their transition? Yeah, again, um, well, I don't know how to translate this, but in Spanish we say that que pesado eres, insistiendo lo mismo. So I don't know how to translate this anyway, whatever. Again, um, um, we have a good example, I think, in Barcelona about, uh, in that sense, uh, an institution which is kind of uh, fostering innovation in the city, which is uh, Barcelona Activa. Uh, which is basically a kind of a institution which is uh, uh, supporting both uh, in the first, in the, uh, first uh, stages entrepreneurs and also startups. And it's a kind of a giant in the city, promoting in that sense innovation. So um, I've, uh, even I'm not at all an expert on this issue about, let's say, the work from municipalities. I think that doesn't matter if we're talking about municipalities or regional authorities or um, state uh, governments so on and so forth, but the, the focus on a uh, trying to, uh, um, to help especially the ones who are starting a company that uh, from the very beginning designed the company from an uh, eco-innovation perspective, I think is key. And, uh, through, and you will have different tools in order to do so. 
I mean, of course, I mean, uh, providing uh, programs like um, um, curation uh, programs, um, integrating eco-innovation in the, in the curricular of universities and also in the schools. We know an institution from uh, basically the Netherlands who is working uh, very strongly on trying to, to, let's say, to create this uh, entrepreneurship spirit within the, the, the high, high school uh, students. And they have been very successful. And in fact, they are very surprised for the ideas that they are, uh, they are basically uh, collecting from this uh, kind of uh, people. Thank you. OK, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one final question to round off the session. And it's, it's a, bit of a bit of a challenging question. So I'll give you a minute to think while I sum up this, the session. But I'd just be intrigued to know from all your varying perspectives, if you were going to find an SME, found an SME tomorrow, and um, you know, ignoring all technical challenge, suspend all disbelief, what would be the one kind of market need that, you'd, that you would really like to solve? So, I'll give you my example, which, which might help you think. I really, really want someone to invent a pill that I can take, which means I don't have to slather myself with sun cream. And that might not seem like a circular economy idea, but of course, if I don't need the sun cream, I don't need all that water that's transported all around the world, I don't need the plastic bottle, the pill is a lot more resource efficient way for me to protect myself from the sun. So that's my kind of call out. If anyone's a chemist or a pharmaceutical company, please invent this, I'm, I'm desperate for it. So what would the panel like uh, to see kind of invented or an SME to, to deliver? But I'll just, we've only got a minute, so really quick answers. Um, and just while you're thinking, I'd just like to thank the panel to sum up. I think it's been absolutely fascinating just to see how much is going on. I've actually been quite inspired by how much support is out there to, to, for SMEs from various agencies. Um, we've heard about cross-pollination hubs. We've heard about how a sense of mission is important. We've heard about kind of piloting. Um, and identifying kind of key sectors that are important for a particular region, providing training and kind of showcasing best practice. So we've, we've, we've seen what's available and it fills me with a lot of optimism. So you're gonna have 10 seconds each. What's your key idea that you want someone to find an SME tomorrow to solve? Uh, okay, I don't have an invention it, itself, but I think what, what has inspired me is that the, the new plastic economy work that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is doing, in doing their research, they've chosen the most difficult aspect of plastics to address first, the most daunting challenge. That's what they're, they're focusing their energies on. And so my thinking is that, that the moonshot for me would be fashion as one of the most difficult industries to focus on because of all of its complexities as the second most polluting industry in the world. And that that's where innovative business models come in and that really fashion is the next food in terms of consumers demanding accountability and supply chain transparency, and that emerging business models and entrepreneurs who take advantage of that challenge will be the ones that will see the most interesting things from in the future. Whoa. All right. we're, we're really out of time, so five seconds each. You're out of time. Oh, that's, that's a whim. Anyone else got their burning idea to share? No. All right, then I'll let you off the hook because we ran out of time. Um, so well done, you let them off the hook. Right, well, please join me. I've really enjoyed this session. Join me in thanking our excellent panel and uh, stay for our next great session.